Hi. So welcome to Study Chess with me. And we're now moving to the third chapter um, from Pachman's great book, Principles of Pawn Play and the Center, his second book on his uh, Complete Chess Strategy trilogy. And the chapter is called Special Kinds of Past Pawns. So here we have the first diagram, and it reads, Among past pawns, there are three special kinds which have a particular importance. The outside, protected, and connected past pawns. The outside past pawn usually comes in its own in the endgame. Here we have white's A pawn is classed as an outside passed pawn as it is further than black's C pawn. From the pair of, black pawn, of blocked pawns on the king side, white wins easily. A4, king d5, a5, king c5, a6, king b6, king takes c4. And of course, the king then picks up the pawn on f5 and wins the game. So here we have the first game of the lesson on special kinds of passed pawn. And as you can see, it's a game between Flor and Romanovsky played in Moscow, 1935. The lesson begins with explanations by Ludwig Pachmann. The advantage of an outside passed pawn resides in the fact that it lures the enemy king away from our future object of attack. Of course, such a pawn is much more difficult to utilize in an ending with many pieces on the board. All the same, it can tie down enemy pieces on the wing while the decisive breakthrough occurs on the other. This means that simplification and transition to the endgame are the most important prerequisites for utilizing an outside passed pawn. Now, in the game, Pachmann foregoes on any kind of analysis until move 23. So we'll just move right ahead to it. And here we have a Nimzo Indian. Nothing to write home about. Okay. Rook F D eight. Now Pachman does add the following comment. He says that instead, Knight takes a four, Rook a one, Knight B six, Rook takes a seven would have been better for Black. But he played instead Rook F D eight. A five, Knight A eight, and yeah. We know a few things. I mean, pretty much any player after a certain point understands that knights are not best placed on corner squares. Rook b7, exclamation point. And he points out the following. White could also play bishop, whoops, bishop e3 with pressure against black's pawns on a2, sorry, a7, square on b6, and e6. Presumably e6 would be with the knight. He prefers instead the slight but lasting advantage afforded him by an outside passed pawn, as in the game, which he now obtains after the forced exchange of his D pawn for black's A pawn. So, rook takes D4, knight C5, E5, bishop E3, rook D D8, Rook takes a7. And he comments, The strategic picture is now clear. The further course of the game shows that it is not easy to force this pawn through. However, to prevent its advance, black must remain at least one of 
sorry, must maintain at least one of his minor pieces on an unfavorable square where it has little scope. In contrast, White's blockading knight on c5 is extremely well placed. Okay. So it's not just a question of my past pawn is strong and yours isn't. Here we also have an obvious battle between the placement of the minor pieces. Black's minor pieces are placed on a8, a knight, and e7, which granted is not necessarily badly placed, but it's not also very actively placed. It's protecting the c6 pawn, and it's pretty much prevented from doing anything immediately in the center. So not great. On the other hand, if we look at white's pieces, that knight on c5 is a monster. I mean, it really is. You can see that it's controlling so many great squares. And of course, it's blockading the c-pawn. But more than that, the bishop on e3 is actually very well placed. It's sustaining the bishop on it's sustaining, sorry, the knight on c5. It's also attacking the square on d4, preventing the rook from placing itself there. And finally, it has a full range of action on the king side if that should ever become a factor. So, knight c7. Black must quickly drive white's rook from the seventh rank. So, h3, knight d5, rook b7, knight d6, yeah. Knight b5, rook d2, f5, f3, f takes e4. And now white's aim is to bring about, is that correct? No, sorry. It would have been better to keep the king's side position blocked by playing instead f4. as White himself will later need to open up this wing anyway. So why make it easy for White? Or why do White's work for him? In any case, f takes e4, f takes e4, g6. Okay, now the knight is starting to actually have some scope as it's threatening to enter on the very good square, f4. Queen g4, king h7. And he points out, now white's aim is to bring about a minor piece ending. Exchange off the rooks and play this endgame with the minor pieces in which presumably white's pieces and the passed pawn will be much stronger. Rook f2, queen e7, rook fc1, six, exchanging off the queens. Remember, the goal here is to find a transition into a favorable endgame. So we have that great pawn on a5, and then we try to decide what kind of endgame is going to give us the most chances. Not every endgame is the same. In his case, he presumes that he's explaining that the minor pieces will play the better endgame for white. Knight f8. Even now, white cannot force his a pawn through, so he must exchange the last pair of rooks. To do this, he must first drive black's knight away from f8 in order to penetrate to d7 with his rook. So right now, unfortunately, that knight is protecting d7, a key square, apparently, so that for him to be able to penetrate and therefore later exchange these pair of rooks, he has to first get rid of this knight. Okay. Bishop f2, king f7, bishop g3, knight g6, rook d2, rook a7. Rook d7 check, rook takes, knight takes, king e6. Knight c5 check, king d6, bishop f2. Okay, and we finally achieved our much 
planned endgame. How do we convert it? So black plays knight c7, which is flagged as a mistake by Ludwig Pachmann. He says that instead, this, ma this makes task white's task much easier. Actually, knight f4 was stronger. White would first have to dislodge this powerfully placed knight by king f1, followed by bishop e3, king c2, sorry, king f2, king f3, okay. So basically he would play king here, bishop here, and then move the king up. And that's how he would be able to get rid of that knight. A lot of work, but it's an endgame, so maybe he has the time to do this. It's maybe not, it's possibly not even a problem. Nevertheless, it would have forced White to work harder for his win. So, knight c7, g3, knight a8. Oh, dread, oh, dread. So the final phase really belongs to a book on endgame theory. Still, it is an excellent illustration of our theme. By threatening to advance his a-pawn, white diverts his opponent's pieces away from the center and the king side, even though this entails the loss of his outside passed pawn, meaning the a-pawn. King g2, king of Knight e7, king f3, g6, knight d3, knight c8, bishop c5, check. White's bishop takes over as a blockader while the knight attacks the king pawn, or rather the e pawn. This, is, this uh, text is uh, in descriptive notation. And The g pawn, okay. Six, knight b2. So white now threatens knight c4 and knight a5. Then after the forced, king d7, bishop f8, h5, g4, would allow the decisive entry of his king to attack the weak pawns. This plan is only possible because black's pieces are tied to holding up the a pawn. Now, in case you're wondering, I mean, obviously after g4, you might be wondering, well, can't he lock up the position? He can't. You can play here, for example, and hope to try to play this. And maybe you'll manage, but there's no need to let this happen. Play here, then king g4 and h4. And yeah, thank you very much for that nice little h pawn. So instead, he plays knight d6. Bishop takes, king takes, knight c4 check. King c5, oh ho. So he does point out that after king e6, trying to keep that e pawn protected, white's a pawn would win the game for him. His king would simply cross to the queen side and then play to b7 after a7. So black prefers to remove this thorn in his side, but at the expense of his kingside pawns. So were he to play king e6, basically he's saying that, fine, you can protect your e pawn, but white's king is simply going to march all the way over here, since you're going to keep that e pawn protected and the knight is still attacking it. And I'll play a7, king b7, and thank you very much. So knight c5, king c5, knight takes c5, 
king b6, knight takes g6, king takes a6, e5, and he adds no further comment because obviously he must think this is just straightforward. And here, black resigned. Okay. So it is much more difficult to utilize an outside passed pawn in the middle game. But even here, in many positions, it may force the opponent to direct some of his pieces away from the main scene of the action, which makes it easier to begin an attack. So here is the next entry on the lesson of special passed pawns. And this is a game or an excerpt of a game between Cherniak and Unziker from Moscow Olympiad in 1956. Bachman explains, in this game, Cherniak Unziker from the 1956 Moscow Olympiad, Black carried out a well-planned maneuver to exchange his C pawn for White's A pawn, then to advance his outside passed pawn in instructive fashion despite the fact that White activated his pieces and penetrated to the seventh rank with his rook. So in this position, he played g4, and it should be pointed out that Unziker, black, is going to be the more successful here. Bishop b4, knight d5, king g7, rook d4, bishop takes a4, rook takes c4. And already we have that position he described, the powerful A pawn against the C pawn. In this case, the A pawn is going to be the more powerful of the two. Bishop b5, c7, bishop d6, rook a7, a4, g5. So an interesting but unsuccessful attack. He does, however, point out that c4, an attempt to exchange, of course, the C pawn for the A pawn, if black were so willing, would also not have saved the game because after bishop e8, knight c7, bishop takes c7, rook takes c7, rook b4 presents a significant advantage for black. The black A pawn is much more dangerous than the white C pawn. And it should be added that here, black has two things going. First of all, you can see that the C pawn can't move because if you do, well, you lose the bishop. Now, of course, you can simply play bishop d5, but after bishop d5, and this is just an illustration of some of the ideas, this is not necessarily the best line that would be going. You can then play a3, and move your rook to a4, protected by the bishop, and help force that a pawn forward much faster. So rook a7, for example, here wouldn't be much help. Or bishop a4, blocking it, just as an example. g5, f takes g5, f6 check, king f8, knight c3, bishop e8, bishop d5, bishop c5, rook a6, rook d8, bishop c4, bishop d4, knight e4. And he does point out that If white were to try simply knight takes a4, then rook c8, bishop d5, rook takes c2, would be better for black. Now, in case you're wondering why he leaves that c pawn to begin with, he cannot play bishop d3. It's not an option because after bishop d3, Bishop c6 check. And we have a little problem here, Houston. As you can see, the king is stuck. 
and therefore you're forced to give up your rook for that bishop to be able to save yourself from mate. So knight takes a4 wasn't really an option. Knight e4, rook c8, bishop d5. Bishop c6 is still a problem. Rook takes c2, rook a8. And yeah, not knight takes g5. Pachman is quick to point out because of rook c1 check, king g2, rook g1, and you lose the knight. King f3, rook takes g5. So rook a8, g4, h3, g3, knight takes g3, bishop takes f6, knight f5, rook d2, bishop e4. So you can see that all the same, I mean, black really put up resistance. I mean, white really put up resistance trying to give black as much trouble as possible in spite of the very obvious disadvantage he's at. Rook d8, rook a6, b2, knight d6, and yeah, that a pawn is just unstoppable, isn't it? Bishop takes h7, bishop e6. Yep, go ahead, take my pawns, I'm not worried. d1, king g2, bishop b3. And yeah, you've taken all our kingside pawns, but that one remaining black pawn is going to decide the game. Knight d6, a3, knight f5, knight, bishop d5, check, king g3. Bishop b5, and that bishop pair is brutal. a2, knight e3, rook d2, bishop c3. Mm. Rook e2, check. Oh, nice. King takes e2, bishop c4, check. Taking the rook on a6. And of course, after that, the bishop, uh, the pawn uh, on a2 cannot be stopped. So a very nice conclusion. And... That will wrap up the lesson today with Ludwig Pachmann. And in the next one, we will look further into this chapter on special past pawns with more examples. Thank you for joining me. Happy chess and good mates.